singularity. Thank you very much. So I am going to start singularity. today by asking you a question. So please, would you raise your hands? I'm going to try and see beyond the lights. Please raise your hands if you have heard of Bitcoin. Excellent. Now, the funny thing about that, I've been doing these types of presentations for a while. And when I used to ask that question to people two years ago, three years ago, almost no hands went up in the room. Because it's only really been in the last couple of years that we've started to hear about Bitcoin and about blockchain technology, which is the underlying technology of Bitcoin. In fact, in the last two years, blockchain technology has gone from being almost completely unheard of to literally front page news. So here you can see, you know, in the Financial Times, front page of the Financial Times, block, uh, banks seek to harness blockchain technology for settlement system. And on the front cover of The Economist, perhaps the article that most launched Bitcoin into the public awareness, um, how the technology behind Bitcoin could change the world. So we've gone from almost unheard of to front page news, and rightly so, because the technology behind Bitcoin can and probably will change the world. It can change the way that our governments interact with us. It can change the way that we interact with each other. It will upend our companies and the way we do business in the same way as the internet did back in the 1990s. So it's worth thinking a little bit then about those 1990s and what the internet looked like in the 1990s because it gives us an idea of why it's so hard to see where blockchain technology might be going. So I want to talk to you about my first experience of work. I started work at Deloitte. Uh, I worked in the London office, and I started there in 1995. And I got no laptop computer. I didn't get a mobile phone. I did get a pigeonhole. And my physical mail was delivered to me two, three, four times a day. I used to go down and, and pick up the mail. Because if you wanted to send a message to all of Deloitte London, the thousands of people who worked in Deloitte London in 1995, you had to have that typed, photocopied or printed, and hand-delivered to the thousands of people who worked there. Now, I don't know about you, but like, it's almost unimaginable now that we did without email, without the internet, uh, back in the 1990s. Can you imagine organizing a conference like this without access to email? or the internet. But that's because the internet wasn't all that usable. This is what the internet looked like in 1995. We literally hadn't worked out what to do with it yet. We, you know, kind of sort of knew what it was for, but we had no idea of what was coming. We had no idea about Twitter and Facebook. We had no idea about online shopping. Um, instead, it, it looked like this. But over the coming decade after 1995, the commercialization of the internet changed everything. And in particular, the mass adoption of email changed everything. Because now, you could send something from your computer to someone anywhere else in the world. And we do. At the moment, we send 12 million emails a second worldwide. Mass adoption, literally mass adoption of email. And that's all well and good, though, because when you send a document from your computer to somebody else's, you're sending a copy. You send a copy of that document. And that's, you know, it's good for documents, and it's good for maybe photos. I like to send lots of copies of photos. Um, it's good for spreadsheets, all of that sort of thing. It's great for presentations. It's not good for money, because if I send a copy of money, if I have a, you know, a thousand yen, and I send a copy of that thousand yen to somebody else, and I keep the original, I think they're probably not all that happy about that. So we need to think about a different way for doing this with money. And the interesting thing about that is that that's, it's called the double spend problem. It's called the double spend problem, and it is the classic problem in online payments. And that is the reason 
that when you go to make a payment now, whether you use a credit card or your online banking or even your watch, whatever it is, there is a large institution that is sat in the middle of that payment somewhere. It might be um, your bank. It could increasingly be the government. It might be Apple or Facebook or Google, any of those. But there is always a large institution stood in the way of your, of your payment, making sure that it happens, making sure that it's secure. But it's like somehow the internet moved on in the 1990s. But digital payments got stuck, it didn't keep up. We left digital payments behind in the last century. This was recognized by the economist Milton Friedman. He said in 1999, one thing that's missing but will soon be developed is a reliable e-cash. He went on to talk about a way by which we could transfer value over the internet from A to B without A needing to know who B is or B needing to know who A is. So he was talking about the digital version of actually handing over a physical note. That's what this is all about. How do we make the ability to transfer cash possible online? Now, Friedman died, unfortunately, uh, in 2006. And so he didn't live to see the start of this prediction come true. Uh, in 2008, this white paper was published, Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. It was published by Satoshi Nakamoto. We still have no idea who that is. A person? A group? We don't know. But the first line of this white paper is exactly what Friedman was talking about. A purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash would allow online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution. And so in 2009, the following year, Bitcoin was born, the world's first cryptocurrency, still the world's largest cryptocurrency, although there are now over 800 of them in existence. This is by far the best known. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about how Bitcoin works. So the main difference is that you don't need any large financial institution stood in the way of your transaction. Anybody can make a transaction on the Bitcoin network. So you can propose a transaction. Uh, that transaction is secured uh, using public-private key cryptography, and it's sent out to this vast network of uh, users who keep the network secure, who keep copies of the digital ledger on their computer, copies of the entire ledger. And every few minutes, all the outstanding transactions are wrapped up into a block. This would be from the very early days. We're up to about 400,000 now. But you know, they're wrapped up into a block, and they are uh, verified by the network again. And then each block is added to the chain of blocks before it. And that is how a blockchain system works. The important thing is that every block contains a little piece of the block before it. And that's important because it means you can't go back 10 blocks and make a change. So the Bitcoin network is what's called immutable. It can't be changed. If you want to make a change 10 blocks back, you have to change not just that one, but every block since. And it's very, very difficult to do and basically impossible to do without it being really obvious to everybody around you. And so we have um, this idea of a currency that can go exponential. We have a currency that goes from being uh, a you know, a, a, a physical thing that we do, a physical cash transaction, uh, to becoming a, an online digital transaction. And we know that when something becomes digital, it has the, the chance to become exponential. And that's what these two graphs show. Um, these graphs are about two weeks out of date. And as many of you know, two weeks is a long time in the world of Bitcoin. But anyway, we'll use these. So this is the, the market capitalization of Bitcoin, the total value of all the Bitcoins that are out there at the moment. When I showed this two weeks ago, it, it had just gone over 70 billion US dollars. Uh, it has, in those two weeks, gone over 80 billion US dollars and is back down at around 75 billion US dollars. The interesting thing about that is that when we get to a currency of these types of amounts, of course people start to sit up and pay attention to it. And that is what we're starting 
to see happening. The actual value of Bitcoin is getting an awful lot of press attention. But actually, I think the other graph is more interesting. So the other graph shows the network hash rate. This is the amount of computing power that is being applied to the network to keep it secure. And the way that this works is basically each time a new block is created, the Bitcoin miners compete to be allowed to create that block. And they compete by using computer power. And so more and more power over time is added to the network. And let's give some context to this number, 7.5 exahash. Again, this was two weeks ago. It's gone up since then. 7.5 exahash, this is the number of transactions that are done per second, number of hashes per second. If you were to take the world's largest supercomputer and add it to this network, it would make basically no difference whatsoever. If you were to take two million versions of that world's largest supercomputer and add it to this network, you might get to about 1%. So that's the sort of size of the network that we're talking about now. This is an unthinkably large amount of computing power that is being used to secure the blockchain network. So that's a little bit about currencies, cryptocurrencies. And uh, one of the things I did want to just mention, particularly because I'm here in Japan, so Bitcoin is the largest cryptocurrency. But Ripple is the third largest cryptocurrency, about 25 billion US dollars currently. And Ripple is a particularly interesting currency because it's made to act between the banks. It's made to, to take money and move it across borders. If you think about how the banking system works now, if you are a bank and you want to interact, you're a bank in Japan, you want to interact with a bank in the US, then you need a relationship with a bank in the US. If you want to interact with one in the UK, you need a, a relationship there. If you want one in New Zealand, you need a relationship there. We end up with this huge like, mishmash of relationships that every bank that wants to do these types of transactions has to maintain. And so what you end up with is the correspondent banking system where only some banks actually maintain these relationships. You end up with a complex, costly, inefficient way of transferring money across borders. What Ripple does is it sits in between. That means if you're a bank in Japan, you only need to maintain a relationship with the Ripple currency. And then they have relationships with banks all over the world in that same currency. And basically, um, there are now six, more than 60 banks in Japan signed up to uh, a joint venture which enables those banks to use Ripple to translate currency worldwide. And it saves around about 60% of the processing costs of the correspondent banking network, as well as meaning that every transaction that is done on this network is instant. It's settled instantly. You think about that when we're trying to send currency overseas. Wouldn't that be nice? But currencies is only one thing that blockchain can do. And so what I want to do is talk a little bit about what are the other things that we can do with a blockchain network. So I have three things I want to talk about. The first one is registration and transfer of assets. Now, of course, currency is an asset, and uh, we use blockchain to register and transfer that. But any asset which can be uniquely identified can be registered and transferred on a blockchain. And the amount of value that that gives to you depends entirely on how they're currently registered and transferred. So let's take the area that I know best, the financial markets, uh, and we take you know, trading of shares. There are already a good set of institutions in, you know, involved in this. We have good ways of registering and transferring shares. And so the value of a blockchain network here is not something totally new. It's about how do we make those existing systems more efficient. And that's exactly what we're starting to see happen. You have the Australian Stock Exchange, the London Stock Exchange, Toronto Stock Exchange. Um, I've just come from speaking in South Africa where the securities depository has an entire subsidiary set up just to look at this. And here we have the Japan, the Japan Exchange Blockchain Consortium, now more than 26 members. This is moving this technology on for trading of shares, for settlement of shares, for voting, uh, shareholder voting rights. These are the types of things you're starting to see being done here in Japan. 
I think one of the interesting things about blockchain technology is it is particularly disruptive for areas where there is a single middleman. And exchanges, in particular, and other uh, organizations in the financial markets are recognizing that threat to their business model. And this is what we're starting to see as a result of this. They can't just ignore it. This, uh, this change in technology is coming anyway. Another area where, though, you might see transfer of assets on a blockchain is land. So here in Japan, your current land registration system is pretty good. Most places in the developed world, the richest na nations in the world, for the richest people in the world, have land transfer systems that are pretty good. They might be a bit slow, they might cost a bit, but they broadly work. That is not true everywhere. So of the 31 countries in Africa, sorry, of, of the African countries, 31 of them have less than 5% of their rural land registered at all. Imagine if you were trying to get a mortgage on your land or something like that, even just trying to transfer your land to somebody else, and you have no formally recognized title. This is a real problem in certain parts of the world. And so we see companies starting to work on this exact issue. Uh, ben Ben is a startup company. They came out of the Techstars Accelerator program. And they are looking at, they work with the Ghanaian government. They're a Ghanaian company. And they're looking at providing land security by putting all of the land titles in Ghana onto blockchain. But that's just the start. Because once you have it on the blockchain, then you can do so much more with it. And so Barclays Bank are working with Ben Ben and they're providing mortgages. If your land title is on a blockchain, you can now get a mortgage through that exact same application. And in the coming months, they will be providing the ability to do your electricity payments, to do your water payments, to do your rates payments, to receive rent if you have rented your property out. All of those things on the same application uh, that's you know, entirely new bringing a whole lot of people back into uh, the financial economy within Ghana. And then what about those assets that are not currently registered and formally transferred at all? What about diamonds? What about food? What about medicine? So we start to see organizations getting into this. We've never had a way of doing this before. And now we have this way that's specifically created for this type of transfer. And, and so we have organizations like Everledger who basically provide a way of tracking diamonds from where they are mined to where they are sold, which means that when you buy a diamond, you can be certain it's not a conflict diamond. You can be certain it hasn't been stolen. We have organizations like Provenance who are looking at um, the way that food is caught or is uh, created or is grown which means when you go to a supermarket or a restaurant, you buy a fish, you know it's been sustainably caught. That might be, I believe, very important, and particularly in New Zealand, it's incredibly important. It's going to be very important for the way that we eat in the future. We've just seen Walmart uh, announce a blockchain-based system with IBM, which means that every single piece of food that is sold in a Walmart store will be recorded from where it has been created to where it is sold. The interesting thing about that is if there is a food contamination scare, they can immediately know where all of that food is and have it withdrawn off the shelves immediately. And what about medicines? Being able to track medicines, think about a vaccine, for example, from where it's created to where it's administered. Thousands of lives could be saved by being certain that those vaccines have been kept at the correct temperature from just those, you know, putting it onto a blockchain system. So that's the first area. And the second is digital identity. We put more and more of our lives online now. We do our banking online. We rent cars online. We rent hotel rooms or Airbnb, I suppose, these days online. Uh, we do a lot of our social lives online. We even do dating online. And yet when we come to prove who we are, particularly if you think about opening a bank account, we're still using paper-based systems. We're still using our passports, our driver's licenses, all of these things. So what I am hoping, and we're starting to see this happen, is that we'll have ways of securing our 
digital identity using blockchain. Now think about how that might work. Rather than having to use a passport, you could split your identity up into tiny little bits. Your first name, your surname, your address, your date of birth, your qualifications. And have each of those separately recorded, confidentially, verified perhaps by a bank, the government, in, the in qualifications, it might be your school or university, and then have those able to be shown to just the people you want to see them. And that's what we see Civic doing. So Civic are one of lots of organizations playing in this space. But they have a mobile phone app. You can put the various pieces of your identity onto it. You can have your bank or a government agency verify that that is true, and then you can show it to just the people that you want to see it. Australia Post are working on a very similar system. In fact, their system's just about to go live. And they believe that it will add 11 billion Australian dollars annually to the economy, just from getting more people online, doing more things, and from ironing out all those efficiencies where we, inefficiencies where we show our passport like 20 times to different things. The last area I want to talk about is smart contracts. So when we look at the Bitcoin blockchain or ones like it, they have the ability to register an asset, to transfer an asset, maybe to record data and prove that it's true. But there's a system out there called Ethereum, and that's just the first, there will be many, uh, which allows for smart contracts. And that means within each block that is put onto the Ethereum network, which works in a very similar way, instead of just putting data, you can put an actual computer program into a block. And you can have that program run when a particular event occurs. Imagine, so you could have a weather derivative, and you could say, you know, a weather insurance. If the temperature is over X amount today, this contract will pay out. If the weather is under a certain amount, this contract might pay out. So lots of things that you can do with smart contracting that you can't do now or you can't do easily now. One of the things that we see is this being used to replicate things that are done in paper. So uh, we have this very complicated paper-based system of transferring shipping around the world. And what we're starting to see now is smart contracts used so that when a boat lands at a particular place, the GPS tracker shows that that's where it is, and the goods automatically move from one person to another. And that's really interesting, but I think there are many things that we can do that we haven't seen done before paper-based or otherwise. And so I want to just show you a couple of them. Look, and what I would say is, these are at very early stages, okay? This is the early, this is like the 1990s of the internet. So firstly, we have the worldwide supercomputer, Golem. What Golem allows you to do is to rent out your computing power, your laptop or whatever, when you're not using it. Not all that often in my case, but anyway. Uh, when you're not using it, you can rent it out, and people can use it for tasks that require specifically high amounts of computing power. Now, we're already seeing this with cloud computing, but this is distributed. It means no one company controls that. You're not having to get your computing power from Amazon or Microsoft. You get it from all of you and all of your computers, and each of you gets paid every time I use your computing power. At the moment, this is only being used for um, rendering of computer graphics for designers. But in future, we'll be able to use this for any type of computing that requires a high amount of power. The next one, this one's very close to my heart, uh, the basic attention token. For anybody who hates digital advertising, this is the one. So this is part of a, a new browser called Brave. And what this means is you get to opt in to what particular types of advertising you want to see. The browser actually sees what do you actually pay attention to on there, and it pays the publisher for the amount of time that uh, you spend interacting with that content. So the advertiser gets 
guarantee, like actually knows how much time you've spent with it. They get to uh, pay for something that they know you're looking at. You get paid, and the publisher gets paid. It's like a win-win-win. But it takes companies like Facebook and Google out of the equation. The third one is, uh, and this is a social media platform. So think like, uh, like Facebook um, or Medium, if you use Medium here. Uh, so it's called Steam. You basically create content. You create an article. You publish it. And then if people like your article, they can give you rewards for it. And of course, then once you start doing that, then you have the equivalent of Twitter. So this is, it's very early stage, by the way, this is a blockchain-based Twitter. You pay every time you want to post. The idea is it gets rid of a lot of the rubbish that is currently on Twitter. But you pay a very tiny amount, one cent, perhaps, to, to post on Twitter. And then, if people like what you're posting, they pay you. Every time you, they press like, they pay you. And you might think, nobody's ever going to pay to press like on Facebook, on Twitter. But they do. They really do. When it's tiny, tiny amounts, they will reward the person who has created that content. And we're starting to see that up and running now. Just a few things from the very early days of the blockchain-based internet. Where might this go? What sorts of things might we see? As you start to look at the other technologies that you are hearing about over the next few days, or the next two days, start to think about how might we pay for them? What else might we pay for if we were able to do it in tiny, tiny amounts? What are the sorts of changes that we might see from a, a blockchain-based system? I'll leave you with Mark Andreessen. He is better at visioning the future than I am. And he says that Bitcoin offers a sweeping vista of opportunity to reimagine how the financial system can and should work in the internet era. I believe that blockchain is even wider than that. It allows us that opportunity to reimagine re how all of our systems can and should work in the internet era. And my challenge to you is over the next two days to think about what will that mean for you, for your lives, for your businesses, and for how you go about making a difference in the coming years. Thank you.